If we have a whole lot of Year 7 students studying Mandarin for one term, that's not studying an Asian language. It's not studying any language at all. And this is what most of your 75% really is. It's just people dabbling. They're not actually doing anything really with that language. That's sort of point one. Um, speaking at home. Speaking, writing, reading are completely different cognitive processes. I know so many people who speak an Asian language who cannot write it or read it. So you need an educational policy, I think, which is going to pick up on that. Uh, and counter kind of a, a related point that second generation children really resist learning their parents' language. Uh, maybe in the third generation they're interested in coming back and picking it up. But um, from what, where I sort of see, you know, um, language drops away quite quickly in that next generation. They speak, uh, sometimes they understand what their parents say but refuse to speak the home language back. You know, they speak back in English. So we've got sort of uh, that kind of problem there. Um, just a minor one is when you do get interracial marriage, often they don't speak each other's language, so they speak English. Yeah, um, so they're just some points, I think, which maybe do need to be thought about. Definitely. On the first point, I agree entirely. I'm a product of the New South Wales curriculum, and I learned Japanese for 100 hours. My Japanese skills are woeful at best. <laughs> I have a rudimentary understanding of the Japanese language, would not be able to navigate myself in Japanese anywhere at all. The point, though, is that it is a misrepresentation to say that there is nothing being offered out there. We do have a language program which at least introduces students to languages other than English and Asian languages as well in particular, and that can be the springboard for more language learning later in life. So I accept your point completely that that is not going to produce proficiency in Asian languages, but it is at least an entree. The other point to make is that given the factors that we've talked about, it may not be necessary to have a school system which actually produces students that are proficient in Japanese, simply because, as I've said, there is a huge amount of English in Asia and the rest of the world, and because there are already Australians who have more advanced Japanese language skills. On the second point, I agree entirely again that simply because one speaks a language at home, one is not going to speak that language well, one is not necessarily going to have comprehensive written skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. My mother is originally from France, and my French skills were initially quite rudimentary. However, having that connection with another language actually led me to learn French in high school and go and exchange to France. So I think while it is not necessarily going to equip people with comprehensive language skills, it will be, once again, a very good entree. And there will be many cases where speaking a language other than English at home does in fact entail quite advanced language skills and written skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry I missed your first part of your talk. Um, but uh, just uh, from what I did here, I did, I've got sort of two questions for you. One is, um, uh, so you, you speak a little bit of Japanese? Well, sort of. That is a full extent of right. it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. And, and, and that is uh, exhaustive yeah. skills. I, I just used to, did, have you been to Japan? I have. You have. Um, so my second point really relates to, um, I guess, uh, sort of some qualification of, of um, let's say, some, some sort of anecdotal research right. that, you, you, that you've done. Um, and I think that the, the purpose of cultural literacy needs to be teased out a little bit further. Right. And um, the basis behind your data... Um, I'd agree with this gentleman that um, I, I think it's it's um, the little bit of the talk I heard. I, I'm I'm not convinced um, the rationale behind cultural literacy, as you've addressed it, is it, it, to my mind reasonable because I think that cultural literacy should more be focused around relationship, um, particularly and we're talking about um, Asian um, uh, Asian languages, Asian culture. So I don't dispute the fact about uh, English. I think that's a reasonable um, thing. But, um, for example, I'd, I'm, I'm more interested in looking at the question, um, rephrasing it more around, are schools the appropriate place to be learning Asian languages? So whether we should be... This is, it sort of comes back to the question of, are schools factories for learning or equipping people for something in their adult life? And I, I don't... I, I'm almost thinking 
after hearing you, I think it's really provoked a question in me that um, if, if Asian languages are to be learnt, that schools are not the appropriate place to do it, um, based on your reasoning, but for different, for different things. So I, I think that the relationship that we're trying to achieve through cultural literacy, um, from, from what you've told us, to my mind, hasn't, hasn't been really um, addressed because the data you've given us about the number of people who speak languages or inter, inter, interracial, intercultural marriages, um, it's, a lot of that uh, cultural literacy is pretty, pretty meaningless and thin. Like knowing what food people eat, um, listening to K-pop, I mean, th those things are trivial and meaningless, really. I mean, when it comes to cultural literacy, if we're talking about being prosperous, so the, the conclusion of your talk, are we, being, are we really being readied for the Asian, so-called Asian century? I think we need to have a bit more substance behind what this thing of cultural literacy is, what, what, it, what, what it consists of and how we're addressing ourselves for it. I think you're right that often the kind of cultural literacy that will be acquired will be relatively superficial. My point, though, would be that in all likelihood, the kind of cultural literacy that is going to be required from Australians to prosper in the Asian century will only be relatively superficial. So there will be relatively few individuals who will actually need what you might call profound Asian cultural literacy, which will probably get by with relatively superficial Asian cultural literacy in the same way that people can effectively engage with Australians without necessarily having a deep understanding of the Australian psyche, if such a thing exists. Relatively simple connections can be made on the basis of a relatively simple understanding of Australian culture. And I think the same probably works in reverse. Um, ben, first of all, thanks for the presentation tonight. You've obviously done a lot of research into this. Um, I'll, I'll make a couple of questions and statements from the context of a um, practitioner of this, having um, worked in Asia for the last three and a half years, pretty well across every country dealing with central bank, sovereign wealth funds, etc. I've had a lot to do with uh, a, a vast number of Asian cultures, particularly from a practical business perspective. Um, and there's, just following on from both these gentlemen here, um, again, I'd urge you to go back and sort of delve into that 75% figure, because to give you a practical example of how that's an absolutely meaningless figure, and this needs reform, is my son, uh, who's in kindergarten at Mossman Public, does Mandarin for 40 minutes once a week. That is a complete waste of time. When I lived in Singapore, my son went to a pure Mandarin preschool. So the reality is whether you think government should spend less or more money, my point is the question needs to be asked, how is that existing amount of money actually being spent and what are the outcomes we're getting out of that? So that's, that's the first point. Um, the second point... I don't share your rosy picture in terms of the cultural literacy within Australia. And again, I'll, I'll put my bias here. I think a lot of your comments in relation to language, I think I tend to agree with. Um, the reality is, particularly when you're dealing with large corporates in Asia, um, most of the people you're gonna do business with speak English anyway. Certainly at an SME level, it's a bit different. Um, but the broader issue, I think, again, is cultural literacy. And, and I could, for example, reel off the number of instances of Australians making massive cultural mistakes, whether it's trying to organise business lunches in Ramadan in Malaysia, uh, through a whole range of other different issues. So, uh, look, the reality is cultural literacy at the pointy end is appalling. Um, now, how you go about addressing that is, is, is sort of another discussion. But I think when we actually sort of draw out these numbers, what I would like to see isn't so much the ABS statistics in terms of what people speak at home, but what I would like to see is cultural literacy utilisation rates. And by that, what I mean, um, forget about saying 10% of all households speak this. What we should be doing is looking at, for instance, ASX top 200 companies and seeing how many of those executives, senior executives and board members either speak a language or have actually worked in Asia. And I'll make a bet that that's probably standing at 2 to 5%. Um, and so again, it's not so much an issue of government addressing that. I think Australian companies have to go out and address that. But my comment to you is that I think we need to separate the sort of ABS, sort of statistics, statistics, and then there's damn lies in statistics numbers. And at the pointy end, in terms of business and what's going to drive growth in this Australia and what's actually going on, because I think the picture would be very, very different in terms of cultural literacy. To start with the last question first, I think you're entirely right that the simple fact that we have X number of people speaking Mandarin, for example, at home does not necessarily imply that the people in key business and political positions in Australia 
will have those skills. The point, though, is that insofar as there is a requirement that there be Australians in general with those skills, we will be able to meet that demand. In any case, the people who are in those senior positions will presumably be able to rely on translators and a whole other source of means of acquiring cultural literacy. So there would be that training available if people actually have that need at that high level. What this implies, I think, is that there is no need to teach everyone compulsory Asian languages courses or Asian cultural courses if only a very small minority of Australians are actually going to require those skills. So I suppose I would conceive of Asian language skills or Asian cultural skills in the way that you might conceive of specialised skills that people learn at university. They're extremely valuable and will become increasingly valuable given the shift to Asia, but they're not necessarily skills that everyone in society needs to have. On the point about cultural literacy being woeful amongst certain key segments of the Australian population which actually require cultural literacy. I do not have all of that information, but it may well be true. I think the response to that is, once again, to go back to the response to the third question, which is that if people actually require that kind of cultural literacy, then there are the means in Australia to acquire that. And further to that, there might be the broader point that the kind of natural acquisition of Asian cultural literacy that I'm talking about is something that will increase with time. So there may be a generational dimension to this. Australians who were born in the 1940s and the 1950s may have a much more limited amount of Asian cultural literacy than Australians born in the end of the Cold War years and the 1990s. If you look at people from my generation, for example, it seems as if there's a very significant portion who just have that natural Asian cultural literacy on account of the fact that the kind of Australia that they know is a multicultural one, and that has always been the case since their birth onwards, whereas Australians of an older generation may not necessarily have that. On the first question, it is probably true that if you're going to be learning Mandarin for 40 minutes a week, the outcomes are going to be paltry at best because it is an amazingly complicated language to learn for someone from an English-speaking background. And in a sense, that means that the programs that we have in place are tokenistic, if you like. I think that is probably true. The only point that I made, though, would be that it provides at least an entree into Asian languages and Asian cultures. And if there is a serious commitment to learn an Asian language, then that can be pursued in a later high school and at university. Now, it may well be the case that that is not adequate for the needs that we have. But if that is in fact the case, and we need to have comprehensive Asian languages programs from even primary school onwards, then there needs to be a demonstration that there is in fact a need out there in the economy which is not being met by current programs. And I'm open to the possibility of there being that need, but no one in the debate on Asian literacy in its linguistic and cultural form has actually brought forward the kind of evidence that indicates that there is a huge skill shortage there. Um, <coughs> hello. I, I, I spent um, eight years uh, working and living in Asia in financial services, and I had a number of Asians, particularly from a Chinese background, uh, working for me. Um, I agree with you related to the uh, language issue and I don't think it's that important. I also um, think that one can get by uh, with actually working out when the religious festivities are and what you can serve at business lunches. I, I think all of that can be solved um, relatively easily, and those who are sensitive to such things will sort it out themselves. Right. What staggered me, and still staggers me, was the contrast between what the people who worked for me knew about my culture as against what I knew about theirs. So, for instance, I would have a, a Chinese actuary who who had uh, grown up in a secondary school in, in China, um, and, uh, and he'd uh, obviously he'd gone to university, and he'd ended up perhaps being educated in Singapore and such like, and he turns up working for me. He knows about George Orwell. Um, I ask him when he read that, and he says, well, I must have been 14 or 15 at secondary school. I say for my cultural background, well, I bet the, uh, you know, the end of animal farming in your culture was different to mine, you know, because I know about your censorship. No, he says, school library wasn't sufficiently organized to manage that. <laughs> um, so um, he had picked up about my culture. The people who worked for me um, knew vaguely about the Magna Carta. Uh, one of them actually was conscious of the beverage report. Um, now, um, what did I know about Chinese culture? 
Now, I was part of the fin Western Financial Services, which had the colossal arrogance to think we could take our models into China and Malaysia and India and such like and sell them. What did we know about the way they organized education, what their culture had been related to cooperatives and things? Absolutely nothing. So I, I, I don't think, I think it would be a great shame if the issue of making our children more conscious of Asia revolved around language. For, for one reason, uh, the Anglo education system seems to be about world uh, worst practice in terms of teaching language. I had 700 hours of French. I can only just about order a cup of coffee in Paris. What the hell was all that about? So please, let's not do that again. But somehow or other, whether it's related to legal backgrounds, to history or something, we really need to open our education process up so that we get a consciousness of what's happened in, in Asia. That seems to me to be actually far more difficult than organizing language, it act because it actually involves going across the whole range of, of, um, of our education system so that our children know, for instance, I mean, they may know about Rutherford and such like in physics. Who were the Chinese researchers? Where does the cultural background come from? And then perhaps our children will be equipped to work with the bright products from Asia and they'll be able to get on well together. Because at the moment, I'm afraid they're colossally disadvantaged because of this imbalance in the knowledge of the background of the Asian uh, countries. I suspect that you're probably entirely correct that there is a huge amount of ignorance out there in the community when it comes to Asian history, when it comes to Asian philosophy, when it comes to Asian culture broadly conceived. I would add to that though that there is probably a lot of ignorance when it comes to Australia's own history <laughs> and Australia's own culture. So for example, when I talk to my peers who are the product of the Australian educational system, it becomes quite clear that we know very little about Australian history. And all the generations of Australians have a much more acute sense of Australia's past and where we've come from. So perhaps this problem in relation to the history and culture of Asia is more a problem associated with our educational system in general, which does not pay enough attention to history and where we've come from, both for Australia and for the rest of the world. On another point, though, following on from that, I think that the situation is probably not quite as bleak going forward in that part of the reason why we've been so focused on European history, European culture, North American history, North American culture is the huge amount of influence and power of Europe and North America. But as economic forces and military forces push us towards Asia, there will probably be more acute awareness of the history of Asia, of the cultures of Asia. So I see there being a natural trend which will ameliorate the deficit to some extent. And added to that, there is probably a need to revitalize the teaching of history in general across the board. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting commentary. And I, and I agree with much as has been said already. Um, just by way of credibility, I guess, I spent most of my working life in Asia. Um, and I'm singularly monolingual. Um, do I think that was a good thing? No, I don't. Uh, now, I, I come at the thing, however, rather from a slightly different direction, I suppose. One of which is that I'm concerned about creating opportunity for, for people in Australia and for children and, and, and adults in Australia, less about compulsion. And I think one of the problems we have now is that the ability, the actual ability to take, and I'm not talking about people who come from ethnic backgrounds, who will have a facility in Chinese and a knowledge of Chinese culture, or at certain elements of it, uh, one of the areas I'd say we're fairly deficient in is in that respect is Indonesia because we ha don't have a lot of Indonesian migrants, which are, I'll come to in a minute, which I think is terribly important for us. But, but um, on the whole, I, I'm concerned that the opportunity be more broadly spread, the opportunity to thrive in Asia. Now that thriving is, I think, not just a matter of, of what we can invest in, it's more the fact of what our people can and are now doing. Enormous number of, Asians, uh, of Australians are living and working in Asia. Uh, our strongest industries in many respects, once putting mining to one side, are in the service industries. Now, it's perfectly possible to get along in Asia, in most places, dealing in English. But you don't do it nearly as well as you could if you had some additional language capability. And um, I, I worked in a number of, and 
had a lot of influence in some respect in the development of organizations in a number of parts of Asia, from Japan through to Thailand and down to Indonesia. And I have some reasonable instinct for how to do things in a number of those places which are not simply, which are not language dependent. It, it has to, agree with, to, to do with development of various empathies and the way you look at people, look at how people act and how you listen to people. But nevertheless, my skills would have been much better had I had the opportunity at an early stage to do an Asian language and not French and German. Now, which Asian language? Uh, obviously, that, <laughs> there's no such thing as a general Asian language, and each is very different. Um, but I think that's, that, that's an area we need to look at in terms of how we create the opportunity rather than the compulsion. I also think that we could give a lot more emphasis to encouragement of Australians and Australian students to spend periods of their time studying in Asia as Asian students do in the West. And we are really deficient in that regard. We have enormous numbers of students come here from Asia. We have a pitiful handful that go and spend any part of their academic life back in Asia. The final thing relates to Indonesia. I, Indonesia, I actually think that in terms of a, a language that should be virtually compulsory from an early stage is Indonesian. It's a, it, to, to speak Indonesian not extremely well, but to speak it adequately is not hard. And it's a language that children can learn fairly easily. Instead of which I find that my grandchildren, my grandsons and granddaughter learn Italian. Fascinating, but not particularly useful. And for 40 minutes a week. And for 40 minutes a week, right. That figure is a recurring theme, unfortunately. I think you're entirely right that there will be significant advantages associated with speaking an Asian language. And particularly Australians from Generation Y and downwards are turning increasingly towards Asia as opposed to Europe or North America. That is where there is a huge amount of scope for increased economic opportunities and increased e educational opportunities, etc. That argument, though, as strong as it might be, in a sense dovetails nicely with the position that I'm advocating in that it puts the onus and the responsibility on parents and the students themselves if there is to be a significant opportunity associated with speaking an Asian language and speaking it well, then that will be something that people out there in the community decide to take up themselves without the government needing to make it compulsory. I think that the savvy people are probably already doing that. There are constantly stories of wealthy Americans sending their students, sending their children, sorry, not to France to learn French, but to China to learn Mandarin because they see that that is where the major economic opportunities will be in the future. I suppose the overarching point is that as strong as those incentives might be, that does not necessarily call for a government response. It calls for individuals to be making those choices for themselves and to be acquiring the skills necessary to be successful in the Asian century. I hope they have the financial means to do it. That's the problem with our program. That's fine for the affluent, the very affluent. It is not fine for providing opportunity for the people from groups in, in, in most of our society who doesn't have the affluence to do that. But I think there, are, there can be systems or structures made available which would be expensive, which would provide those opportunities If you want to learn Mandarin, for example, in New South Wales, it is possible to do that at any high school. There are courses which allow you to learn languages by distance. Obviously, that will not be as useful as learning a language in a classroom, but that is what I did when I learned French. I grew up in rural New South Wales, and there are opportunities there like that, which means that irrespective of where you are in the country, you can, in fact, learn Mandarin or Japanese or Indonesian if you have the desire to do this so. And that will be part of the government school system. Uh, the last two gentlemen actually covered many of the points that I uh, wish to sort of raise quite a, in quite an articulate way. But usually when there's a potential policy um, response from government, there's an assessment of um, likely or potential costs of the current arrangements. Um, are, there, are there any, st or are you aware of any studies or estimates of the, the costs that might accrue to Australia as a whole under the current um, arrangements that would lead to a need for a potential policy response? 
are you talking about the costs associated with not enacting new languages? Uh, uh, costs, costs of um, a supposedly low level of literacy, Asian. Right. right. Yeah. That is actually one of the striking things about the debate. There are many academics, many commentators, many politicians advocating more education programs to teach more students more languages other than English and in particular Asian languages. But in all of this debate, there is no sense of what the kinds of risks are associated with not speaking Asian languages. The overall argument seems to be that there is this dramatic change happening in world politics, that is, the rise of Asia and the decline of North America and Europe. And as a result of that, there is an urgent need to be proficient in Asian languages. But there is very little substance to the argument. It is more a broad brushstroke case being made. There is no analysis of precisely which languages we're deficient in, precisely to what extent we're deficient in those languages, and precisely what the costs are associated with being deficient in those languages. So I suppose the simple answer to your question is no, not as far as I'm aware. But obviously, that would be a really valuable <laughs> contribution to the debate, but it simply does not exist. And I think the onus of responsibility is on those advocating for more language education programs to provide a rationale for learning more languages other than English and to put that in terms of dollars and cents, if possible. Just, just one last quick comment, um, and it's kind of in support of what was being said here about language again. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was running a series of lecture seminars at Lanzhou University with postgraduate students. The, I was born in the 1940s, so the other language I studied was Latin. <laughs> Not Mandarin. Uh, where things, where we struggled so much of the time was with abstract concepts. Yeah, um, and indeed one evening we spent one hour with uh, two translators trying to work out how you put the word empathy into Mandarin. Yeah, uh, now I wished I'd known how to do that myself because we could have cut through a lot of nonsense <laughs> in trying to do this. And a lot of my, my seminars were, okay, this is the concept. Now, let's try it this way, let's try it this way. What have you got in Mandarin? They would kick it around the classroom. That was constructive. But it meant that my classes never got finished. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of uh, thoughts. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, actually, um, it's not... Maybe it's not proper, but um, how many of you have uh, thought about sapir warp hypothesis? It's about, um, it's a long time ago, but they say um, the language is the grid to see the world. So uh, you say the EU countries, they have a lot of um, people, p polyglots, I think because they are the, lang the same language groups. But I th uh, in Australia, actually, for Japanese, Chinese, Koreans, they are under the Chinese character's influence. So it's easier for them, maybe. So uh, the if, if you are planning for policy for Asian, I mean, it's different from Indonesia, or maybe because they are Dutch and uh, they use uh, Vietnamese still. But um, I think th those things should be in, uh, in the consideration as well. And uh, the culture, yeah, so because you are looking at uh, Another thing is that the, uh, the China, Korea, or Japan, for example, they are Confucius so far. So they look at things differently. So they always think about uh, Asian values. They are different. So they are not really capable of um, democracy and things like that. So, <laughs> so those things, I, I don't know whether you can teach uh, language and then they, they can uh, see the world uh, uh, from the, the Asian perspective. I don't know. So maybe which one comes first? But this is a kind of a disheveled <laughs> and distracted uh, comment of mine. Thank you very much again. Yeah. I think the first point yeah. is really important. Obviously, for someone of English-speaking background, it will be significantly easier to learn a European language like French or German or Italian than to learn Mandarin. And there is an argument to be made in favor of learning European languages initially as a means of having students become successful in learning a second language and opening them up to learning other languages. Whereas introducing students to Mandarin initially in year seven in high school 
may lead them to recoil just because it is so difficult and it is so hard to make progress and to actually get to the point where you can communicate with people in the language that you're learning, even in a rudimentary way. So there could be an argument in favor of learning European languages for Australians simply because that is an effective way of introducing people to languages other than English. On the second point, a lot has been made about the distinction between Asian values and the kinds of values that flow out of the European Enlightenment, if you like. On the face of it, that broad distinction holds, but then if you look at the key texts of Asian antiquity, you find that there is, in fact, a lot of the values that you see in the classic texts of the European Enlightenment. So, for example, Emperor Sokra of India was advocating before the birth of Jesus Christ a rudimentary form of liberalism. He was advocating for religious toleration. And this was long before John Locke, the classic example of European Enlightenment, was advocating religious toleration. So I think too much can be made of the distinction between Asian values and European values. In addition to that, though, it is possible to learn about, if you like, the Confucian mindset without actually learning Mandarin. Obviously, one's appreciation of the philosophy of Confucius, for example, might be improved by reading the text in its original form, but you can still have a fairly good sense of the value system and the attitudes without actually having a deep understanding of the language. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ben. That was a very interesting talk. Um, just building on really from what this lady has said in the defense of learning languages, um, I don't think it's bad at all to lo learn any language. You know, we start with what we've got, such as Latin and and the Latinate languages, and you build on languages. And uh, I think, as this lady mentioned, that for me, learning a language fluently is really like opening another door, because that's the only way you can understand the culture. If you can't read the literature, if you can't find the word for empathy, even by paraphrasing it, then you're missing out on a lot. It is a very superficial um, level of understanding. So you can't really build on a deep understanding. You might be able to function a little bit to know that you don't have a lunch at Ramadan, but to really understand the, the people and how to relate in an Asian century, then I think certainly we should all be learning as many languages as possible. But if we look at the um, language policies of Europe, you know, those um, young people are coming out of high schools with very high level of language um, proficiency. For example, in Switzerland, um, if you know the ALTI scales, the language testing scales in Europe, the um, sort of an upper intermediate level was what was expected of a high school student exiting high school in English, um, what they call a B2. Now that's a C1. So they're increasing their language levels all the time, whereas we're still just skimming the surface of an understanding of other cultures. And um, so I, I do defend language learning in schools. And however, you did mention, I do have a question for you. You said young people today, <laughs> um, I don't count myself in those, um, have an innate cultural literacy. And I was wondering how you would define that. I, think I don't think you used the word innate, but I think it was that sort of right. mention. <laughs> Maybe that was a slight overstatement. But I think there is probably some tr truth in that, in that if you are, for example, born in Australia in 1990, you will grow up in a multicultural society that will be second nature for you. There is no question about that. And you will of necessity be interacting with a whole host of people from a whole host of different backgrounds at school, at university, professionally, if you stroll down the street, if you go to a store, in all those different environments. Now, all of that kind of interaction is not necessarily going to lead to deep cultural awareness, but it will at least lead to rudimentary cultural awareness, which may be all that is required. And then, in addition to that, in many cases, it probably will lead to a deeper level of cultural awareness and at least a certain amount of respect and appreciation, which might be lacking if there was not that interaction. And I think for most people, that interaction is something that you cannot avoid, it just happens. It is what we do in Australia.